Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of Sports Spectrum with Chris Reese, former New Orleans Saints safety Super Bowl champion, is brought to you by Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. An opportunity for you and I to release a child from poverty is available right now through Compassion International. It's $38 a month. It's tax deductible as we near the end of 2019. Keep that in mind. But it's also an opportunity to release a child from poverty. And that's the most important thing. Doing it in Jesus' name, food, education, medical care, vocational training. Man, this is a great opportunity to connect you with a child in need. Check out the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, sponsor a child today. Before we get to our interview with Chris Reese, I want to tell you about a brand new podcast we've been telling you about for a few weeks now here on Sports Spectrum. It's called Football Sunday, and it released Monday, December 16th. And we are excited about this podcast. It's our second podcast from Sports Spectrum. And it's a great opportunity for you to hear first-person stories from current and former NFL players about how God is working in their life. They tell amazing stories on this podcast. And it's not a very long podcast to invest in. It's only five to ten minutes long each podcast episode. features people like Thomas Davis, Josh McCown, Kirk Cousins, Trent Dilfer, Drew Brees, really awesome stories from great guys who love Jesus and have seen the Lord work in their lives. It's available everywhere podcasts are found. You can subscribe today. It released Monday, December 16th. It's called the Football Sunday Podcast. Do us a favor, do yourself a favor, and go subscribe right now. Really excited to be joined by Chris Reese today on Sports Spectrum, Super Bowl champion with the New Orleans Saints back in 2009. Chris played five seasons in the NFL, was undrafted out of college at Georgia Tech, then signed with the Falcons, and then the Saints came calling and he played four seasons in New Orleans from 2007 to 2010. Chris has got a really great story. He's the guy that recovered the onside kick in the Super Bowl for the Saints to start the second half against the Indianapolis Colts. If you're a a football fan, if you're a diehard Saints fan, you know who Chris Reese is. He's the guy that recovered the fumble, and that really started the Saints on a trajectory to win their first Super Bowl. They're still their only Super Bowl that they've ever won, led by, of course, Drew Brees. But Chris Reese was a part of that team. And now Chris Reese is a pastor. And so it's really fascinating to me. It's always fascinating when we can get a former pro athlete who played in the NFL or played Major League Baseball or played in the NBA or whatever professional sport it is to then go into pastoral duty and and becoming a pastor or ministry. And Chris Reese is now a pastor at Our Savior's Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. He's actually pastoring the Youngsville campus there. And this is a great story. Take a listen to Chris Reese, former New Orleans Saints safety Super Bowl champion here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jason. Glad to be on. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you, Chris. You're a pastor now, but any diehard Saints fan, I make sure that you say the word diehard because casual Saints fan or even casual sports fan may not remember Chris Reese, but you were on that special team squad for the Saints in 2009 when they won the Super Bowl. And so the diehard fans, I remember the guy who covered, who recovered that fumble. I remember the play. I didn't remember that your name was Chris Reese. and and But I remember the play clearly coming out of halftime. But I'm curious, just to start here, how often are you asked about that game specifically? It must be like every day, right? Yeah, I mean, it it's, it's, might not be every day, uh, but it's it's a lot. I, I still, I, I've told somebody the other day, I still have people coming up to me, grown men will come up to me crying <laughs> and, and just go, thank you for what you've done. And it, it, it was, to me, I fell on a ball. Yeah. And, and uh, But to them, you know, especially those diehard Saints fans, I mean, I've had stories where people said my grandfather wanted to see the Saints win the Super Bowl and he, you guys did it and he died of cancer the year after. And so you helped him achieve you know see something he never thought he'd see so that was really cool like it's really cool to see the experience that 
me even playing a game allowed people to have. And honestly, it opens up the door for a lot of different conversations. But let me tell you, Jason, people don't recognize me. Um, <laughs> and so it's it's kind of nice in that respect. Unless I wear my Super Bowl ring, then everybody wants to talk to me. Oh, so, yeah. And I hope, you're, I hope you're wearing that fairly frequently. That, that I remember <laughs> I actually held uh, and wore Drew Brees' ring from that Super Bowl. Oh. He came to ESPN the next year. And I, uh, when I worked at ESPN, I was, I was a talent booker and I walked him around and he had just gotten the ring a couple days before and he allowed me to wear it. And I got a picture somewhere with the ring and I know the rings have gotten even bigger now, but that thing is not tiny. No, it's not tiny. It is a conversation starter. That's for sure. And I don't wear it that much. I think uh, for, for us as players, it's, it is a a proud moment to have that ring and it's great to have, but honestly, it's really what the ring represents. People ask me all the time. They're like, Hey, do you have this in a safe? You must keep it in a safe locked up everywhere. And I'm like, it's on my coffee table, like just in a bunch of change drawer. Like it's like, and it's not that I don't care about it. It's just that it's what the symbolism of it behind it means. It's the guys, it's the blood, sweat and tears. It's the relationships. It's a piece of hardware that's it's replaceable, but those memories that I have attached to it, th- those, those aren't replaceable. No, that's that's good. And I know for those listening, they might be like, okay, what play are we talking about? So it was called Ambush, right? Or the part yeah. of the play was called Ambush. It was coming out of halftime of that Super Bowl. It was the Colts and the Saints in 2010 in uh, early February. It was in Miami. I remember that because I covered it for ESPN down there. So can you tell us ambush? And for those listening, I'll let you do the explaining instead of me on where the play kind of came about. And it's certainly it's meaning it was a huge play in the game. Yeah. Um, what's the funny thing is I didn't realize how big the play was until after the Super Bowl. I didn't realize how big it was until we won the game when everybody wanted an interview. You had Adam Scheffner come up to me and I'm just like, who am I? I'm a nobody. Why would you want to come up to me? And I realized, Oh, this is a big deal. I had no idea literally at the time how big it was, but ambush started um, about two weeks before the super bowl. Um, We had tried to think of a way. We always try to think of a way to get an edge on a team when it comes to special teams. Um, And we look for little tendencies, whether it's a fake punt that we can run or a fake field goal or something kind of trickery that we could run. And honestly, that year we went 13 and 0. Um, We lost our last three games. We never had to use anything trickery wise. So never did we once use anything in a game. But two weeks before we saw that the Colts had a tendency, their kickoff return team had a tendency to leave just a little bit too early before the ball was kicked, which left a gap open. And once the ball goes 10 yards, you know, you can recover. It's a live ball. Well, we came up with this ambush onside kick and Thomas Morstead started practicing it. He would just kind of squib kick it to the side of the sidelines that would go 10 yards. Roman Harper, our safety at the time, he would our starting safety. He would recover it um, in practice. And uh, I would loop behind and just kind of be a backup just in case the Colts grabbed it and they tried to run it in. I was going to stop them. I was a fail safe. I was never meant to recover the ball. Um, well, what ended up happening was when we got into halftime, it was 10-6 playing the Colts, Super Bowl 44. Um, it was a back and forth game. They were, uh, we were kicking it off. They were going to start with the ball. And it really seemed like it was going back and forth. Whoever had the last possession was going to win the game. It really seemed like that. So we knew we had to steal a possession because Peyton Manning wasn't going to give it to us. Well, sure enough, Super Bowl 44, P- Coach Peyton sticks his head in our huddle while we're back in the locker room and extended halftime. And he looks over at Roman, who I'm sitting next to, and he says, hey, we're, we're going to run onside. Make sure we recover this ball. Don't let it go out of bounds. So that was the call. I mean, no one thought twice about it. No one was nervous. No one was biting our nails because our commander in chief said run a play, and we ran it because we trusted him. The whole year we trusted what he did. Yeah. So sure enough, we come out of halftime. And I'll tell you, Jason, the biggest thing that I remember was um, Coach Payton switched switch sides, which is really big because he wanted the recovery to happen on our sideline, not their sideline. Mm-hmm. But also my big thing was I didn't – I felt like since it was a prize, I didn't want to give it away. I'm terrible at giving away surprises. Like I'm not good at that. So <laughs> I was worried about how I was standing, how I looked. Was I doing the right thing? And I, I just – sure enough, I knew. I'm like, they know. They know it's coming. I gave it away. Like I was so nervous just to give it away. Yeah. Um, and, and sure enough, we kicked that ball um, to the sideline. Hank Basket didn't go back as, as quick as we thought he would. He hung out and uh, a little, little more. So as I'm coming around behind everybody, it hits off of him, and the ball just comes screaming at me. And so sure enough, I throw my hands and my body at it kind of to the side. And I, as I'm going down, 
the ball squirts through my arms, through my legs, and I hit the ground and I pin it against my side. And all of a sudden, everything just goes black. And I feel like this Mack truck is sitting on me and just a pile of guys <laughs> just get around me. And it, the, the call took 63 seconds. And for 63 seconds, I was in a street fight laying down. That's what I tell people because that's what it was. It's a under melee under there, right? It, it is. People ask me all the time, like, hey, what do you? What happened? What, what really happened underneath that pile? And I'll just – I'll joke around. I'll say, you don't want to know what happened. But honestly, <laughs> I don't remember. I, I, I don't remember a lot of what happened because I was so focused on getting that ball. I was determined, and I knew right away when I got under there, no one, I don't care how strong they were or what they were going to do to me, was going to take that ball away from me. I watched the replay of that before we started our taping, and it kind of looked like it was stuck underneath your leg a little bit, but you were still grabbing it. Does that sound – like what it was? Yeah, it was kind of pinned against. So what they teach you is obviously cradle that you want to cradle the ball, almost like a baby. You want to cradle it. That's sure. the best position because you can cover up the whole ball. Well, I was in like opposite cradle. I don't even know if you have a, a call for that, but it's like I pinned it against my leg and I was kind of pinned down. People were laying on my chest. Well, when Jonathan Casillas comes in and kind of spears the pile at the beginning, it jarred my arm loose to kind of grab two hands on the ball. It was still exposed, but I still had a good grip on it. Mm. And so people ask, did it ever change hands? Did it ever – it was always in my hands. But guess what? I know other people had a part of that ball too and had their hand on it. Um, and and I thought I was fighting a lot of times with Jonathan Casillas who was on my team. Um, I, I was screaming at him, let go of the ball. I got it. Let go of the ball. But he probably didn't know that Hank had his hand on it too. So the Colts player, I mean – so it was just too – it was just too much, and I knew I knew I was going to come out of that ball with a pile. I just knew I had to hold on for, for long enough. I love it. And then, obviously, the Saints go on to win the Super Bowl. Tracy Porter with the interception off Peyton Manning to run it back, and you know New Orleans goes crazy. What was that like, uh, that Super Bowl parade? I got to imagine, because they haven't had one since. It's been 10 years now, the 10-year anniversary. It had to have been complete just chaos. It was. It was chaos. <laughs> what was supposed to take, I think the, the parade was routed. It was supposed to take two hours to go through. They called it Lombardi Gras. Yep. And New Orleans is known for their Mardi Gras parades and the floats and everything else. It took six and a half hours to get through there. And the reason is people were climbing on our floats. They were, wow. they, they, they measure Mardi Gras crowds by how deep the crowd goes. And that's how they measure it. And they were 10, 15 people deep. The whole entire city of New Orleans swarmed to that Super Bowl parade. And it was an, an amazing experience. Oh, I just can't imagine. That's awesome. And you can never replicate that. That's the thing. That's I've talked to a lot of guys who have won Super Bowls. Very thankful to be able to do that. And they all talk about the parade as being the crazy memory that they have. Even more in some ways than the game because of the sea of fans that just come out. And there's millions of people there. Crazy. It was crazy. It, it was it was crazy. And I think following Katrina, New Orleans needed something like this. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a couple years after Katrina and, and still New Orleans was in, in, in a bit of disarray still. Um, and so this brought a national spotlight to the to the city, which is great. But it also it brought hope back to the city. Uh, I was I remember talking to the chief of police during that season and they were telling us and the whole entire team that while we were on our 13 and 0 run that season it, it was the lowest crime rate that new orleans has ever experienced in the history of the city <laughs> during when we were winning so it's like That's we awesome. you know in in those little cities and i say little city like new orleans but compared to the other teams it's it's a smaller city smaller market yeah. i mean but it means so much to them and they are so loyal and when the team wins, everybody's happy. When they lose, everybody's oh, bad. And yeah, so it's last tough. last year was not fun to watch. If you're a Saints fan, <laughs> I felt oh, was so that bad. that game? It Were was you? rough. Oh. It was, yeah, it was rough. It was rough. Walking out of a game like that, I just can't imagine. I mean, there had to be some really a lot of repenting to do over the next few days after that. To use a yeah. to use a Christian term, Chris it's Reese true. is Chris Reese is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. So your title of former NFL football player has moved to now current pastor. So I'm guessing when you were young, pastor wasn't exactly on the bucket list for you, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Why don't you take us back and let us know kind of where your faith kind of took shape? Yeah. Wow. Um, definitely never, ever wanted to be a pastor. Never <laughs> dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would ever be called a pastor. It's still weird when people call me pastor Chris, it's still odd, but, yeah. um, really the journey for me started when I was young. My, my dad walked out when I was two years old. Uh, so I, I was in a fatherless home for, for a very long time, but I realized I was really good at sports and just like you teach a dog to sit, um, 
and, and you give them a treat, they're going to do it long enough. Well, my performance in sports really got me some accolades and some praise. So I, I learned how to be obedient in the performance aspect of sports because I liked the way it made me feel. Mm. And so I became very, very, very performance oriented. It became a part of my identity and who I was. And, um, God wasn't really big in our, in religion, wasn't really big in our family. Uh, we went to church. We were what I called the cheesters, Christmas and Easter. Yeah. Um, we would do that and, and we would go every now and then, but really didn't have, uh, um, an element of faith until I got into to the middle school when my mom invited me to a new church and that she was going to, she was attending. And so we started to go and that's when God started to kind of shake something in me. I heard the gospel preach. I heard Jesus preach for the first time and I'd heard it a lot, but it was really the first time that I felt like, man, this is for me. I, and I didn't know why something was stirring in me and I did my research. I'm not one of those guys that jumps in just without doing it. I did my research. I started reading everything. Who is this Jesus guy? If I'm going to get my life to him, if I'm going to, I want to know what I'm doing. I don't want to just play church. I want, I want to be the church. And I didn't really know at that time what that meant, but I knew I wanted to go all in. And what people didn't know is I looked good on the outside, but my inside was crumbling, Jason. It was, I was a, you know, all American in high school. I broke every record you can imagine. I was, I did all these things, offers from everywhere and it looked really good. But I, I remember my, my story really changed when I was driving home. I was a senior in high school in August of 2001 in Georgia. And as I'm driving home, I just, I just remember feeling just depressed. I, I just remember thinking to myself, um, I had a bad practice and it wore at me, but I just started weeping and crying. Like I've never cried before. Everything was going good in my life. I had straight A's. I had offers. Everything was good, but I felt so broken and, and just I just felt empty. And sure enough, um, I pull over my car. I'm in my car. I pull over my car, and I just felt this overwhelming sense of peace come upon me. I can't explain it. Um, I know today what it is, but back then I had no idea that it was the presence of God just in that car. And honestly, I, I said this this most authentic prayer I've ever prayed in my life, and probably for the first time. Um, it wasn't God give me something. It was a cry to him. And here's, here's what I said. I said, God, I don't, I don't want to do this alone anymore. Mm. And it was the most authentic prayer I've ever prayed right then and there. Um, I know that I, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I said, I'm going to do this. I went home. I told my mom and my mom had been praying for me for a long time to experience God in that way. And so, um, that's when my walk with Jesus really started. And that's when I started to take faith safe seriously. Well, then you have to kind of acclimate that. And I always, when I hear stories like this, I love, um, the testimonies that athletes share because a lot of them, I wouldn't say they're exactly the same as yours. Obviously we all have our own unique stories and that God has designed for us, but they're similar. And then success and identity comes into play with the athlete as they go to college and suddenly they're trying to figure out how to play football and be a Christian and live the life in college and even more coming to the NFL and your journey wasn't your oh yeah first round draft pick play 15 years 20 pro bowls whatever it was not it was a grind and it was hard so walk us through that journey of yeah. acclimating yourself to college at Georgia Tech, coming into the NFL undrafted, spoiler alert, and then trying to live out as a Christian and trusting God in what seems like a very uncertain time in your life. Yeah, it really was. And that was a journey. I, I realized quickly that I couldn't do this walk alone. And I, I liked starting new seasons and the kind of college became that new season for me um, that I really wanted to begin to change. I wanted to get into the right crowd. Um, what I kind of knew instinctively that the, the people I hung around were going to be the, the, the person that I was going to become. Yeah. So I started attending FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Georgia Tech. It had just gotten started the freshman year that I came in by a guy named Derek Moore. He's a chaplain and current chaplain of Georgia Tech um, still to this day. And so um, he came in and I came in at the same time. He's a former NFL player, um, just a great overall man of God. He's just wonderful. And I started coming to this, these cheesy FCA events where we would have 10 people. It wasn't much. And you'd have this piano and we'd sing these cheesy Christian songs. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know? <laughs> and, um, but I, I knew I just had to keep going. That's my mind. Just, just kind of keep going. So I kept going to them. And finally, Derek, he, he kind of pulled me to the side and he said, Hey, I've been noticing you've been coming. You're one of the only football players to attend. Hey, what do you think about becoming the FCA president? Now I'm a freshman. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to do this. I'm going to have tattoo. I'm going to have Christian tattooed on my forehead. I'm already getting hazed as a and teased as a Christian as a as a freshman. I don't want to be teased to be the the Christian guy on the team. 
So I told him initially no, but he just said, go and pray about it at home. So for seven days, I sure enough, I prayed about it. I came back um, and I told him, I said, I don't know why, but I, I, th- I feel like I'm supposed to say yes. <laughs> so I said yes. And it was the best yes I've ever, ever really had because through that process, God really grew my faith and he, 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 he allowed me to step out and experience what it meant to, to live a Christian life, not to be perfect. Derek would always say this, and I use this a lot, is this, it, we're not meant to, we're not called to be perfect. It's, Christians are not called for perfection. We're called for direction right. and where our life is pointed. And so the Christian life, I, I wasn't perfect, but I prayed that my life was pointing towards something. So I would lead meetings. That's where I started beginning to get in front of crowds and, and speaking a little bit more um, and going more forward with my faith. And by the time I was a senior, we had grown from about 10 people to about, uh, you know, 75 to 100 people at, at a weekly event. Um, and we had prayers like we would as a senior, as a captain, I would lead our team every single day after practice. We would pray mm-hmm. uh, and anybody who wanted to stick around could stick around. But we would pray the coaches. They would walk off because they can't be there. But we would pray. And sure enough, everyone stayed around. We had Muslims on the team. We had Jews, Jews on the team. We had different r- beliefs on the team, but everybody wanted to stay around and pray. And it really did something to our team. It's not that we got better. It just, it created a different environment. And so I really grew in my faith and realized that I want to take this seriously. And I grew a lot there. And Derek played a big, 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 big portion in that. Yeah. And then you get to the NFL, but it's, again, it's not the easiest trek to get there because you go undrafted. And I have to imagine that was difficult to, to go through thinking that, okay, I think I'm good enough to play. And you go undrafted. Then you end up with the hometown team. You sign with the Falcons. And then yep. what happens? Cause it isn't, it yeah. isn't the fun. It isn't the best ending at that point. <laughs> no, it's, it's, let me say this. I, I, I was, uh, I was a decent player in college, but I wasn't the best, of course. So I figured I was going to go undrafted. So I knew I was going to have to work my way up. Jason, my big, my story has been just a grind it out, you know, keep showing up, keep going, and God will do the rest kind of story. And that's essentially what I did through the NFL and yeah. was, was, was undrafted by the Falcons. I tell people that I, I uh, had a short cup of coffee with them because they cut me pretty soon. And so I thought I was going to go back to school, finish up the class or two that I had left and get on with my life. I was going to get married and we were going to get married in February of 2007. So that next season we, uh, we were going to get married. So it was life was just going to continue on with me. I wasn't boohooing, but sure enough, I wanted to play in the NFL. Well, it happened when, when the Saints were making their run in 2006, beginning of 2007. They played the Chicago Bears in the NFC Championship and they lost. That's right. But yep. during that time, um, the Saints called me and they said, hey, we want to pick you up. This is at the end of the year. I had I had one tryout with Seattle Seahawks. That was it. And no one else called me. That was it. So it was a shock to me that the Saints wanted to pick me up, but they didn't want to just pick me up. They wanted to send me over to NFL Europe. So I took the long route to the NFL. And in 2007, I got married. Two weeks later, I went over to NFL Europe in Germany. And me and my wife, newlyweds, spent three months in Germany. It sounds like a vacation, an extended honeymoon. And it was a blessing and it was great. But we lived out of a hotel for three months and it wasn't the greatest. We got paid almost nothing at all because – the United States and our international tax, German tax, got taken out. So we got paid nothing, but that wasn't the point. Right. We just had to play the game, and there was a lot of guys in there. So that was the last year of NFL Europe. I had a great year as a safety. Matter of fact, I made the all-world team that year and just played. I had a phenomenal year. Well, came back two months later, went to training camp. So I'm extremely tired at this point. Um and I never had, didn't have a shot to make the team. I, I honestly didn't. I was third or fourth or even fifth on the, on the depth chart. So I just wanted to play my heart out. But I was one of those guys that I was going to annoy you with my work ethic. That's what I was going to do. And so <laughs> a lot of the, the veterans hated me because I, would, I was on the scout team and I would just try to grind and work them and get around them and whatever on special teams. And, and really, Mickey Loomis tells me the story, the GM for the Saints. He tells me the story about when they started noticing me. And it was actually during conditioning um, because what they realized was when everybody else was whacking off, I was still the one finishing first, beating guys like Reggie Bush, Devery Henderson, these guys that were twice my speed but yet didn't have the work ethic that I had. Yeah. And um, they started noticing me. I started playing better and better. Well, I got I, The last preseason game is all for the scrubs. I loved it because it was for me. So I got <laughs> in and I got in that game and I had two uh, – I had two interceptions, I had 12 tackles, played amazing, played great, didn't know if I was going to get cut or not. Well, I didn't end up getting cut. I actually got put on practice squad for my first year. So the first 
two games of the season. Um, I'm on practice squad. I'm just happy to be a part of the team and, and in the NFL locker room. It was just pretty cool. Well, the guy in front of me goes down. Um, Jay Bellamy is an amazing safety, his special teams guy. He went down and they just said, hey, you're up. Let's go. And I remember my first game was a Monday night game against the Titans. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple tackles on special teams. And that's a big deal when you're only playing, you know, roughly 15 to 25 plays a game. Um, Big deal to get a couple tackles on special teams. And I did that. So I played really well, did well. And for the next four seasons, I I, uh, was fortunate to play in the NFL. Yeah, I I love that. And it's such a, a great story and a journey to understand for people who think, they watch the game on Sunday and, oh, they're just, you know, privileged NFL players who are playing, you know, like, no, these guys grind. So many of them are like you, Chris. They're not Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. They are the guys that are grinding, just trying to find spots, 15 to 20 plays a game. Let me see if I can make my mark. So I appreciate your journey uh, of that. So talk about, as we wind down, your faith in the NFL. What was that like? Because it was brief. Uh, obviously four years or so, five years, but what was that like to acclimate yourself to the NFL as a believer to then catapult you? And then we'll get to that story of how you become a pastor. Yeah. And, and, uh, I was very blessed to to have my faith within the NFL and to have my wife and our, and our strong faith there. And, um, I think in the NFL, it's a culture of, it's a very much a power hungry, fame hungry, dog eat dog world. And so, um, it, it's, it was very difficult to find people that were like-minded in that. I, I feel like every a lot of people in the NFL are religious, but not many people are walking out serious about their faith. So we found a few couples, and we started a Bible study with them, and, and uh, we began just kind of journeying with those few couples and getting really close to them. And that was a, a really fun process. And uh, we would have Bible studies each week, and we began to grow in that realm. And people would make fun of me because I still had my old car. It was beat up. It was... Uh, You know, they were like, why you got enough money? Why don't you buy a new car? And I just, those things just weren't important to me. They never were. And they still aren't to this day. But to me, my faith was. And so uh, after my first year in the NFL, I began to look to my wife and I just said, let's pray about why God has us at the Saints. That's what we really, what's our purpose there? It's not just to collect a paycheck and to play in the NFL. That's a dream, but that's not our purpose there. So we started praying about that. And so what we ended up with was, that we felt like sometimes as rookies come in, it's such a dog eat dog world that, man, we wanted to help these rookies and these even veterans coming in acclimate to the team and to the city the best that we could. And we really felt like that was our responsibility. No one did that for me at the Falcons. And so I wish somebody would have came in and just loved on me a little bit and just appreciated me, asked me if I needed anything. And so that next year um, in 2008, that's what me and my wife did. We just go, hey, let's help as many people as we can. So as rookies came in and they're trying to take my spot, I would go up to them and say, hey, I'm Chris. Um, So glad you're here. And I would say, how can I serve you? What can I do to help you? Hmm. If you need a restaurant, let me know. I would say, if you need a place to stay, hey, if you have a girlfriend or wife, I'd love to connect you with my my wife and, and stuff like that. So it's like I would begin to serve them and help them and love on them. And a lot of times these guys, instead of falling into the wrong crowd, would begin to go and gravitate towards me and what what we're doing. And they could see right away that that was different. And I think it, uh, hopefully it changed some people and it helped spark something different, but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to serve and I realized I was there to serve. And so that helped me with my faith, keep the main thing, the main thing that it wasn't about winning and losing and making money. It was about the relationships in that locker room. And people, people come to me often and say, do you miss football? And I said, absolutely not. I do not miss on Monday waking up feeling like I got hit by a train. I do not miss that. I don't miss the concussions and the broken bones and the torn ligaments. But what I do miss, I miss the locker room. I miss the relationships. I miss praying for one another and struggling through marriages. And because what most people don't see, um, what most people don't see outside of Sunday is is they don't see the relationships between those those families that our our kids would play together and we would love on one another and pray with one another and. And we struggled with one another. And that was that was the beauty of of the NFL when I look back at it and that brotherhood. It was special. Yeah, that again, that's an that's echoed by many players who we've talked to that are retired now, how much they miss the relationships. They don't miss the pain, they don't miss the the work, the training and all that as much as they did it when they, you know, had to do it when they were playing, they miss the relationships. So yeah. so simply enough, you retire and you become a pastor, right? Is that kind of the story? <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Um, what happened? Let me I, let me say this. Uh, <laughs> I think we're fooling ourselves when we. I don't care if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. We're fooling ourselves if we think that 
that some of our identity isn't tied to what we do mm-hmm. and how we perform. Well, I mean, we're, we're foolish if we don't, if we say that, if we say, oh, my, oh, my identity is in God, that's our hope. Our hope is all our identity in Christ. But at the end of the day, we're foolish if we're not thinking that some of our identity isn't tied to what we do. Yeah. So when I, when I exited the NFL, it wasn't because I wanted to go. It's because I got hurt. And um, sure enough, after I won the Super Bowl, I'm going to be honest with you, Jason, like a little of the passion kind of left left me. And mm. here's here's why. Um, I remember after the Super Bowl, about three weeks after the Super Bowl, I look over at my wife. We're driving in a car and I, I look at her and I ask this weird question, kind of shocked her. And I said, is this it? And she said, what are you talking about? And I became depressed at that moment. And, and I just said, all my life since I was a little kid, I literally wrote it down that I would be an NFL football player. Mm. I, I'd wanted to do this. I, I dreamed in the backyard of having that game winning play to help win the Super Bowl, right? We all do it, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, no matter what it is, we all dream of being that hero. And I was blessed to be able to do that. I, I got to play in the NFL. I have a Super Bowl ring. I got like, what more is there to accomplish? It felt so empty, Jason. That's like, I don't know other way to say it, but God was shifting my passion somewhere else. And I didn't know what that was. And he was transitioning me. And I, I, did the best I could when I came back off my injury in 2011, but didn't make the team. And they said, see you later. But I remember a story that really affected me that, that, um, that as I was exiting the Saints facilities, our def- defensive back coach at the time pulled me into a room as we were leaving and he started just bawling, crying. Hmm. He said, I had no idea you were going to leave, but I want to let you know this, that you've affected my mock more in these past with Christ more in these past four years than I ever have in my entire life. And I'm a better man because of you. And I had no idea that I was making that kind of change there. Wow. And so I could realize that I could leave knowing that my purpose might have been just to help that coach become better, a better man, better husband, a better father. Um, and maybe that was what I was meant to do. And so I left there with my head held high, no bitterness, no grudges. I love Mickey Loomis, Sean Payton, all those guys. There's no and, – and honestly, I didn't have a passion to play. I, I so I took a year trying to figure out what my what I was called to do. Um, I was very, very blessed when my dad left when I was two. I told you guys that at the beginning of the, the podcast. But yeah. I, I, um, I left when – my dad left when I was two. But we started to kind of rekindle our relationship a little bit more. Um, and my dad was an addict for a very long time, mm. struggled with a lot of demons in his life. And um, in college, I was very fortunate to lead my dad to Christ. Um, he came to an FCA event that I was leading and gave his life to Jesus shortly after. And I began walking with my dad and discipling my dad, something I never thought I'd do. And amazing. I saw addiction after addiction break. And I just saw just uh, it's it's amazing to see what happens. He's tried it over and over again. But when God intervenes and you have something big and he really broke those addictions. And so my dad at the time, that was a years after he really felt called to get out of the corporate world where he's been all about himself and get into helping people. And so he was taking, he was going to be a substance abuse counselor. So he's taking some classes and he had a project that he was, he wanted to write a book on our story. And he said, will you help me? And I had nothing else to do. And I said, sure, I'll help you. (laughs) Well, I take it to my mentor, Derek Moore at the time. And he said, you got more than just a little project. This is a book. You need to print it. You need to go and speak. And I just go like, wow. Wow. So sure enough, me me and my dad, we self published a book. We we got a writer with us to help us. And we told our story. It's called recovering of a recovery of a lifetime. And really that, Story is all about the recovery of a father-son relationship, and, a, and a, really the the father, God the Father, recovering us to Him, and uh, it's a kind of a beautiful symphony of recovery there, and recovering me, recovery the onside kick, so the play on words there yeah. um, with recovery. So we went around for the next two years, just speaking to any group that would listen to us, and it wasn't about the book, it wasn't about selling books, it was literally just about helping people understand, especially guys that man, God, God, the father wants, wants something special with you. So we did that. Well, when I turned 30, which is a very biblical age for me, God started spark sparking something new. I really didn't like speaking and leaving and not getting a chance to walk with people. I didn't know that's called pastoring, but I I just, (laughs) for me, I didn't like just speaking and leaving. I wanted to kind of lead a group. I wanted, I don't know. I didn't know why, but I felt like I was called to do something different. Yeah. Well, I went down and spoke at, at, at our Savior's church in Lafayette, Louisiana. And as I went down there, me and my wife went down there. I had a friend that worked there. So we went down there. We spoke at a football Sunday and the pastor comes up to me, senior pastor, and said, you want a job? And I was like, no, I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking for a calling. And I don't know what that is. And so I said, he goes, pray about it. And I said, I'm not taking a job here. I live in Georgia. I'm not, I'm not coming down to Lafayette, Louisiana. There's no way I'm going to be staying here. <laughs> well, 
I don't even go back and tell my wife. We don't even pray about it because there's no way I'm leaving Georgia right. in order to go down to Lafayette, Louisiana. Well, we get stuck in Lafayette, Louisiana for four days because of ice and snow. Now, up north, wherever you're from, that might be normal for you. But in South Louisiana, <laughs> ice and snow is not normal. So it was truly freezing over, if you know what I mean. Yes. And we ended up staying for four days and, and just got to know the people for four days, the pastor for four days. And all of a sudden, God started tugging on our heart to come down here. Well, we sold our house. Once again, Jason, I didn't want to be a pastor. Still didn't intend to work at the church and be a pastor. Never wanted to be a pastor. Yeah. Well, sure enough, we sold our house in two weeks in Georgia, moved down, our, our family, our kids, everything else. We moved down to Lafayette, Louisiana, and just started working for the church and doing some outreach in high schools. That's all I was doing. No big deal. A year goes into it. The youth pastor left, and they said, do you want to take that? And I just go, golly. Okay, fine. You know, I'll, I'll take it. College pastor left after three months and because of transition, everything else. They said, hey, will you take this too? I said, I don't know what I'm doing, but okay. So between a year and a half, I had three ministries that I was leading. And I still, I'm like, I don't want to be a pastor. Yeah. Well, as I began to journey on, God started calling me to something different. And um, really, I got called out and said, you're going to plant, you're gonna plant our, another campus for Our Savior's Church. We had uh, five at the time. And he said, you know, you're called to go plant another one. And that's when I started embracing this pastoral role that God had called me to. Um, and I'm, I'm ha I feel more fulfilled now than I ever have before. I'm making less money now than I've ever made in ministry. <laughs> I'm okay with that yeah. because at the end of the day, I know I'm doing exactly what God is calling me to do. And I love that I get to reach people and build lives. And there's something greater that I get to do. And, and it's just, it's, it's a joy. And we just launched our sixth campus in Youngsville, Louisiana. And me and my wife lead that campus. Um, and it, we launched in August uh, of 2019, and it, it's just, uh, it was a really, really fun time. That's a great story, and I'm not going to say this on air because I'll talk to you after, but we have a lot in common. Let's just say that, Chris, awesome. a lot in common, and I'll talk to you about it after the podcast taping is done. But let's close this because this has been a great time, but I want to be respectful to your time. Why don't you share with us what the Lord is teaching you now? That's the last question we ask to every single guest on this podcast on this show. What is God teaching you today, Chris Reese? Wow, man. I don't know if you have enough time there, Jason. Uh, <laughs> what is God teaching me today? Um, God, God has been teaching me, I think specifically through the new season that we're, that me and my wife are in leading this campus. We have five children as well. So, wow. um, that are all under the age or eight and under. So we have an eight, six, four, three and a seven month old. So wow. we're busy at home, yeah. but, um, I think what God is teaching me and what he's been teaching me is he's teaching me um, how to be patient. He's teaching me um, how to be who he's called me to be and nothing more. I don't have to be and strive to be any more than who God has called me to be. And that took a lot of security when, when, when back in the day, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted. And he's really teaching me to be secure in the leader that he's called me to be and to rest. And that's a big word for me right now. Just rest in who he is. Mm. I've been striving, Jason, my whole life to be perfect, to be what people thought I should be, to be what I even expect myself to be. And now I'm at a moment in my walk. I'm at a moment where God is teaching me to just rest in him. Um, and, and not to have to perform, not to have to do anything. And as a lead pastor, I, I needed that. Um, I, I needed to know that I'm not here to please the congregation. I'm here to lead them. And I need to rest in who God has called me to be in the leader that I am, the pastor that I am, the father that I am, and uh, the husband that I am. And there's anytime we operate, this is what God is teaching me to anytime I operate from my wounds, whether it be the wounds, the father wounds that I have, or the fear wounds that I have, or whatever it is, it's never, I always reach for control. I'm not resting, I'm reaching. And that's not what God wants us to do. He wants to want us to rest in him. And what I've learned more now than ever before is that the relationship that I have with my heavenly father is better than anything else that I could ever want or imagine that, that it truly is. I don't have to do anything for him. He's already done it. I just get to enjoy that with my heavenly father and everything else points to that. Everything else that we do from our Bible reading to our preaching, to our prayer, everything else is so that we can be closer to God, not so we can be better Christians. Not so, so we can be better people, 
not so we can look good in front of people, but everything that we do is a means to get us closer to our Heavenly Father, because that's what Jesus did. We're to become, as Christians, like Christ. That's what we're to become, to follow Him. But it's not just in being good, it's in being close to the Father. I remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He just prayed to His Father, let this cup pass from me. Yeah. I always used to thought that meant that like, hey, that God wants us to, he wanted, or Jesus wanted to be spared from the physical pain of the cross. That wasn't true. That's not true at all. Matter of fact, he, he knew he was about to bear the weight of the sins of the world. And in that moment, when an unholy Jesus couldn't be with a holy God, his yeah. father. Yeah. And so you have this separation where Jesus going, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we're looking at it and all Jesus wanted out of his whole walk, all he taught the disciples boils down to, can you get close to your heavenly father? Because when you get close, your heart changes. And when your heart changes, your attitude changes. When your attitude changes, your behavior changes. Yeah. And so we don't have to behavior modify, modify uh, ourselves. We just have to continue to walk with the father. And that's what he's teaching me, just to rest in him and to walk with him. Mm. He is Chris Reese, former New Orleans Saints safety, Super Bowl champion, now pastoring uh, his church, Our Savior's Church, the Youngsville campus, if I heard that if I heard that correctly, right? Youngsville right. in Louisiana, right. outside of Lafayette. And the book, I just was looking it up on Amazon while we're yeah. talking, is called Recovery of a Lifetime. Uh, it is available there, so you can check it out. By the way, you had quite the... Quite the mane going on on your head, a head of hair there, Chris, with the, with the flow in the back, and now it's all tight on the side. What happened there? That must have been hard. Yeah, long hair don't care. You know, I mean, uh, I, I honestly, I got well, I got tired of the long hair, and I donated 13 to inches to Locks of Love. So That's it was awesome. a really cool time, but... Yeah. Uh, the season had to change. I so. understand okay. that. I understand. Well, you'll always have the yeah. picture in the cover of your book to to remember, and right. the Super Bowl, of course, too. So, Chris That's Reese, right. thanks, That's brother, right. for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you, and uh, wish you nothing but the best. Thanks again. Thank you, Jason. What a great story there by Chris Reese, the former New Orleans Saint safety, Super Bowl champion in 2009, and now pastoring our Savior's Church in Lafayette, Louisiana, over at the Youngsville campus. Chris was awesome. And by the way, after we taped this podcast, I shared a little bit about my story of my own relationship with my dad, which Chris talked about, and just some of the struggles that I walked through. And, you know, my dad is not a Christian yet. We're praying for him. We're believing that God is going to help lead him to Christ. He's 69 years old now, and uh, just believing that God's going to do great things for my dad in his life. But Chris took the point to stop and he prayed for me and prayed for my dad after the podcast was over, which was really cool. And I'm super appreciative that he cared enough to do that. He didn't have to do that. Uh, he could have just hung up and walked away and left, but he didn't. He, he, he hung in there and he prayed for me and my dad. And I just wanted to honor him and, and let you guys all know the type of guy that Chris Reese is. If you're down in the Lafayette, Louisiana area, look him up. It's called Our Savior's Church. He's pastoring the Youngsville campus. You can go and check it out each weekend in services down there. Thanks to Chris Reese for joining us here on Sports Spectrum. We also thank our sponsors, Compassion International. We love them. They're great partners with us here at Sports Spectrum. We've seen NFL players like Nate Solder get involved with what Compassion is all about. Nate Solder told us on the podcast earlier this year that he went to Uganda on a Compassion missions trip and came back changed forever, seeing these children be released from poverty and seeing the work that comes with you and I sponsoring a child. And it just changed his life, him and his wife. It changed their lives. And you and I can get involved and it's a real easy way. First of all, just go to the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum. You'll see a list of children there. And as we get near the end of the year here and we're thinking about what are we going to do in 2020 to help impact someone's life. Man, Compassion is a great place to do that. These kids from all over the world are waiting, hoping for an opportunity to be released from poverty. You can make that difference. Go to the website, compassion.com slash sports spectrum. It's $38 tax deductible and pray about it, man. Pray about releasing a child from poverty today. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Sports Spectrum. We're so grateful to have you joining us here. Click that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast on whatever app that you listen it to. You can also find our podcast on our website, sportsspectrum.com. It's over at our YouTube channel. 
and each episode is there as well, Sports Spectrum. And we have a new podcast coming out, Football Sunday. Actually, it's out already. It released Monday, December 16th, and you can subscribe to that podcast as well. Everywhere podcasts are found. We are so excited about the Football Sunday podcast being our second podcast to partner with us along with the Sports Spectrum podcast. You'll love them both, and I highly recommend you subscribe to both podcasts. Thanks for listening. We love you guys. We'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day.